Okay. Welcome. We're going to do the last of the seven churches tonight in, in the Revelation. We'll be in Revelation chapter 3, starting in verse 14. We're going to be talking about Laodicea. So why don't we open in prayer, and then we'll get start looking at the text. Father, again, we come before you tonight, and the blessings that you've given us are innumerable. And so we just want to thank you. We want to rest in your presence and, and breathe in your grace and just be in your presence. It's just the best place in the world to be. I want to thank you for the beauty that surrounds us. I want to thank you for your kindness, for your mercy, for your grace, for your love. Thank you for your word. As we walk through it tonight, help us to pay attention to, to ourselves and to see if, if any of what we hear tonight fits us. And if it does, help us to repent and overcome. We bless you, Father. We pray this in your name. Amen. All right. To the angel of the church of Laodicea, write. So, well, that shouldn't be doing that. All right. So Laodicea, you can see here, is the last of the seven churches. Um, it was, hey, let me just go through the seven churches real quick. Remember, Ephesus was the Orthodox church. They had a lot of information, but no love. The... Uh, Smyrna Church, they were faithful. The church at Smyrna was faithful under pressure. There was all of the persecution they were enduring. The church at Pergamum put up with a lot of shenanigans in their church. They put up with sin. They tolerated sin. The church at Thyatira was the compromising church. Um, they, well, that's weird. Didn't know that was doing that. It's changing pictures. I don't know how that happened. But uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, they they put up they they compromised in order to have peace, and Sardis was the dead church. I don't know why this is doing this. this is weird. Um, they thought they were alive, they were dead. And then last week we talked about Philadelphia, which was the faithful church, and tonight we're talking about Laodicea, which is the lukewarm church. Huh? Oh. Not yours. Mine. Okay. Well, we're going on. So let's talk a little bit about Laodicea. It was a wealthy city. It was so wealthy um, that uh, Tacitus, who was a Roman um, historian, there was there was an earthquake in 60 AD that pretty much wiped out the city. But they were so wealthy and in, in, in all resources all the way around that they didn't ask Rome for help. They just rebuilt their own city. And Tacitus said uh, the Laodiceans arose from the ruins by the strength of their own resources with no help from us. And so it's important for you to understand that when we start all this talking about Laodicea is we talk about the comfort of wealth. And you're going to you're you're going to see a lot of parallels between this church and what we see going on in America today. OK, that's this lukewarmness. So they had a thriving textile industry. Uh, they would send out everything from armor to. Uh, 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 regular clothes to fancy undergarments. They had, they had a, it was a huge textile industry and it was known world over. And, and finally, they had this, they made this eye salve in Laodicea. This is going to be important later. It was a, it, it helped cure a lot of, of eye maladies for everything from pink eye to whatever. But it was, it, it was shipped all over the world. But the one thing that was, uh, the downside was they had a terrible water supply. Um, and you're going to, this all comes into play later on. You see, when, 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 when Jesus sp speaks this letter to the church at Laodicea, it's tailored right to them because of their situation, just like the rest of them were. So when you see this, you're going to go, okay, I have, they're rich. They have a terrible water supply. One of the things about the terrible water supply was, that Laodicea could not endure a siege because they would just, the people sieging the city, besieging the city would just cut the water supply off. And so what would you do to not be besieged? Whatever was necessary, yeah. you would compromise whatever was necessary so that they wouldn't, they wouldn't, they wouldn't try and take you by force. And so, 
they would always negotiate and compromise instead of fighting for what was right. And that's important as we go forward in this. So one of the things that you'll see in Laodicea, and I'm not sure why those faded in, but these are, these are water pipes. These are first century water pipes. And they had one that was a little over six miles long. They had, an, well, they had several that were a little over six miles long that went to Hierapolis. And then they had some that went down to Colossae that were longer than that, 10, 10 11 miles long. Um, and I want you to notice the picture on the left. Um, notice the insulation around it, the concrete around it to insulate it. Was okay. It rock or what? No, it's concrete. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, the Romans had a, a type of concrete that they could pour in water, and oh, it's a supply, and it would harden. And we still, to this day, don't know how the Romans made their concrete. It was a, a, a formula that they that it was unique to them. So yeah, they would they would insulate their 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 water. And these aren't aqueducts; these are water pipes. Aqueducts were bigger, but these were just water pipes that they had. And so all of this has to feed into your mind to understand what he's saying. So again, we started off talking about Ephesus being a city of, of 250,000 people. You know, we're not talking about little backwood cities here. We're talking about people with cutting edge technology and, and doing things that we do, you know? So understand that this, this is, this is a, a unique place. So verse 14 of Revelation 4, to the angel of the church of Laodicea, right? That's what I said. What did I not say? Revelation 3, verse 14. To the angel of the church of Laodicea, right? The amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of creation of God says this. So this is how Jesus describes himself. God describes his presence, the amen. Now, the word means true. The word amen means true. But it really comes along the idea of the last word. When you pray, what do you, what's the last thing you say? Amen. Okay, this is the last word. This is this is the, the summary of everything that's been said. And I am who that is. What was the very last thing Jesus said on the cross before it was done? It's finished. This is the last word. I'm done. We've done what we set out to do. So the amen, he says, and the true witness. Now, the, the true, mine says, mine says the faithful and true witness. Both words come from the same general meaning. And, and the idea is when we talk about a witness, what are we talking about? It was there and saw it happen. Okay, when you use the term witness, there's only two places in your life where you use that term. In court. In court and in church, right? But they didn't have church. Well, they were right to churches. But the idea is, he is, if you called him into court, this is the guy you could rely on. Okay. Now, there are two things that he can witness to. We do, he doesn't say what he's witnessing to. He just says, this is what I am. I'm the true and faithful witness. I'm going to give you an accurate, an, an accurate detail. But so there's two things. He can bear witness for God and he can bear witness against Laodicea. Let that settle for a minute. When you stand before God, 1 Corinthians 3, and we have the judgment of God, he judges our works based on the reward we're going to receive, or we get the reward based on our works. And who's the witness? He is. He is. Because he he's a faithful and true witness. And, and we see that when Jesus was on the earth, like in John chapter 12, Jesus said, for I did not speak on my own initiative, but the father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. And again, in John 5, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, the son of God can do nothing himself unless it's something he sees the father doing for whatever the father does. These things the son does in like manner. He is the representation. He is faithful and true. And so when he stands up to, to call Laodicea before the judgment, he's saying, look, I've got the final word on this and I, what everything I'm going to say is accurate. And then the last thing he says, and he's the beginning. 
or the originator is the best word. Did you know that Jesus was actually the creator? You know, in the beginning. What is the word? No. In the beginning. God. God. What? Created. Created. And who was the creator according to scripture? Jesus. Hebrews chapter 1. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions, and in many ways in these last days, has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he made the world. So God was the movement of creation, and Jesus was the agent. He was the actual creator, it's not just here. Colossians chapter 1, he is the, I'm talking about Jesus. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in heaven, in the heavens, and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. Who created Satan? Who? God did. Jesus did. Jesus did. Now, this is important when you're, this, this verse is really important when you're talking to your uh, uh, Jehovah's Witness friends, because they believe that Jesus is actually not God. He wasn't, I mean, he was Michael, the archangel. Well, this says right here that Jesus created Michael and he created Lucifer. Okay. When you talk to your Mormon friends and they believe that Jesus and Lucifer were brothers, they were siblings from the spiritual marriage of Yahweh to his spiritual wife, and they were humans that became what they became. Again, the Bible says that Jesus created all things in heaven and on earth. So he is the agent of creation. He is why we're here. And that's kind of fun to think about because, you know, we think of, of God as, as you know, the, the creator in the Old Testament and Jesus as the savior in the New Testament. But we kind of have ideas that Jesus was somewhere in the Old Testament, but here you are right in the very first chapter of Genesis, according to the New Testament, saying that Jesus was the one who was creating the light, who created the firmament, who created the animals. He was the agent that made this stuff from the very beginning. That's pretty cool. All right. So we talk about God's presence. We said that he is the last word. We said that, that he is the faithful and true witness and he's the creator of all things. So then we talk about, his commendation. And what commendation does God give the church at Laodicea? Well, let's listen. Listen, verse 15. I know your deeds that you are neither hot nor cold, and I wish that you were hot or cold. What is their commendation? Yep, doesn't exist. He doesn't say, you're doing a great job, but he says, y'all aren't doing well at all. He goes right into their condemnation. We'll get back to that question in a minute. So what is the condemnation? Verse 15. They're lukewarm. Now, in your mind, you're going, okay, what? I know what lukewarm means. Someone that's not really connected. But what did it mean to them? Look up here. You see this map? You see, Laodicea is almost centered between Hierapolis and Colossae. You know, Colossae, that's the, the, the letters from Col the church. of Col We call it the, the Colossian church, right? And as a matter of fact, you read in, in chapter four of, of Colossians, and it says, when you finish reading this letter, send it to Laodicea, and I've sent them a letter that you need to read. So Paul wrote another letter that we don't have, the church to Laodicea, um, the church to, yeah, Laodicea. But... Notice where they are. Well, in Hierapolis, they have these hot springs. And there are bunches of them. I mean, look at the scope of these things. Um, people still to this day go there to frolic in the mineral, the, the hot mineral waters. Well, the people of Laodicea thought, hey, we could have hot running water at our place if we just build these really good pipe system and insulate it really well. We could, it could travel that six miles and get to us hot. Or not. Or not. <laughs> so they would, it, at the end of the pipeline, they got this tepid mineral water. 
lukewarm. Same thing at Colossae on the other end of the spectrum. Down around Colossae, there are lots and lots of mountain rivers and springs and waterfalls, and it's cold water. And they thought, we could do the same thing. And by the time it traveled the almost 10 miles in those pipes, no matter how well they insulated them, it was tepid. It was, it was lukewarm. It wasn't refreshing. Like if you traveled that 10 miles on your horse and went down there and, and got a drink, it was always oh, so refreshing. Not what came out of the pipe. And so when we Jesus talks about this lukewarm, they knew immediately what he was referring to. The nastiness of the water coming out of the pipes. Wasn't talking about a general spiritual condition, which he is in a, in a way, but he's talking about something they could connect it to. This is what I, how I see you. I see you the same way you see that water coming out of those pipes. And that's why he says, I wish you were hot or cold, but since you're not, I want to spew you out of my mouth. You've been to a hot spring? Yeah, no, Got any of that water in your mouth? What do you want to do? Exactly. This is what Jesus is talking about. It's very real, very um, uh, uh, under, easily understandable. So the idea here is there, there are two possibilities about them being lukewarm. Either they are essentially cold like the rivers in Colossae, but warmed by their religious trappings, or they're basically hot but cooled by their self-reliance and apathy. You have a choice. And he says later on, be hot or cold. But choose, choose one. But how does this apply to us? No, you're meddling. What? No, you're meddling. I know. <laughs> Well, one of the commentators wrote this question. I wrote it down because it, it's haunted me for years. He says, is there any soul harder to reach than the one who has just enough of Jesus to think that they have enough? Hmm. So say that again. Is there any soul harder to reach than the one who has just enough of Jesus to think they have enough? Hmm. We never have enough. You see, if you're really invested in a relationship with Jesus, you will have this dissatisfied satisfaction. You're very happy in your relationship, but you always want more. Yes. But how many church members do you know personally who have to be reminded to read their Bible, have to be reminded to memorize scripture, have to be reminded to gather together because... I've got enough. I got my get out of hell free card. I said my prayer. I got dunked in the water, whatever, whatever religious trapping is necessary. And I have enough. So I don't go to hell. And, and I know I keep harping on this and I, I, I again, I, I beg forgiveness, but we have to, as a church, begin to recognize the tares that are growing in among the wheat, the weeds. Remember the parable of the wheat and the tares. Jesus sowed good seed in his field. The man went out and sowed good seed in his field, and the enemy sowed weeds, tares. And they grow together in the same field. Well, what was the field that Jesus planted? It was the church. And in our churches, we have these people who believe they have enough. And it makes church hard. For those of us who are who are satisfactorily unsatisfied, it makes church hard. Um, and so we need to be careful. When we're finished reading this, it says the church of Laodicea exemplifies empty religion, and tax collectors and harlots were more open to Jesus than the scribes and the Pharisees. I was having this conversation today with some pastors, a group of pastors that I was meeting with. And I said, I said, nobody is saying this out loud, but we need to start articulating about this idea of the wheat and the tares. And they were kind of looking at me like, what do you mean? And I said, 
When Jesus was eight days old, where did his parents take him? To the church. To the temple. Mm -hmm. Who designed the temple? He did. God did. Right? And who designed all of the things that were going on in the temple? The sacrificial system. God did. And who was being faithful to do the letter of all those things? The, pri the priests. And who didn't notice that Jesus was there? The entirety of the church. Nobody except for two and two old people who God said, he's coming. And I love, uh, uh, you know, Simeon said, oh, I've seen the constellation of Israel. Now I can go in peace. I'm like, he's like, oh, good, I could die now. You know, and I'm like, yes, he got it. But the high priest didn't notice it. The the the, the junior high priest didn't notice it. The, 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 the low, lowest end of the spectrum. The, none of the, but nobody in the church noticed God showed up at church. Oh, what an indictment for us today. What if we had Jesus as a visitor in our church one Sunday? Oh, everybody was friendly. They went out and shook his hand and said, hello, we're so glad you're here. Didn't even notice that it was the breather of planets. Because we were so comfortable in our religious trappings. We're going to sing these songs and we're going to listen to him preach and then we're going to go home and have fried preacher for lunch. Or chicken strips. <laughs> chicken strips. Anyway, but you get the idea. Would we even notice if God showed up? And we're very, we'd be very keen to say, oh, I would notice. You know, this is Holy Week. I'm chasing rabbits here, but it's okay because I'm the teacher. Um, and one of the things that bothers me way down deep inside of me, if I had been a Jew in the first century and I was 45 or 50 years old when Jesus came on the scene, you know, and I've been, I've been a Pharisee my whole life, like Paul, I've been training to, to, to be in the Sanhedrin. I've been that guy. I really felt that I love God. I knew the scripture and I was, I was in entrapped in the system. Would I have praised God on Sunday and shouted for his crucifixion on Friday? Would I somehow, and I think about the conversation, you know, they're, they're sitting around in the evening and Jesus has been in the temple and he's gone and, and they're sitting around talking to each other. And, you know, hey, Eli, you know, what do you think about this, this Jesus guy? Well, I'm telling you right now that he's got to be from the devil. Because he doesn't keep the law the right way. He doesn't do church our way. He does it differently. And, 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 and so he's got to be from the devil. But the devil doesn't do these kind of works. I'm telling you, he doesn't, he doesn't do church right. He's wrong. And you know that. You've been studying this your whole life. You know that what he's doing is wrong because it doesn't agree with our traditions. Yeah, I can see that, Eli. But no buts, man. He's wrong. And he's going to lead the church astray. And he's a heretic. And he's going to destroy everything that God sent us here to do. You need to understand he has to go. Yeah, but no, there is no buts. Do you understand where we're at? And pretty soon I start going, yeah, I see you're right. Because he's destroying my system. And would I have been one of those guys that said, crucify him? Slay the sucker. He's a hypocrite and an agent of the devil. We know they said that from Mark chapter 3. The only way that you do these things is because you're from Beelzebul. We know they were saying those things. And I, these conversations that went on. And these people that were already separated from God, but very religious. Would I have been one of those? Because it's easy for me in the 21st century to stand back and say, hey, I know Jesus and you guys were wrong. They looked him in the face and got it wrong. Oh, would I have done the same thing? I pray not. Do I have... What was the old thing that the preacher, the old preachers used to say? Did you get inoculated with enough of Jesus that you actually didn't catch the full disease? Just give me a booster shot. 
That's all I need to get into heaven. So what is God's desire? Verse 15, I know your deeds that you're neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were cold or hot. Now, if we take this strictly from a spiritual perspective, what is Jesus saying? I wish you were cold. Talking about the water at Colossae. I wish you were cold and refreshing. I wish you made a difference in somebody's life. On a hot summer day, when they're walking down the road and their feet are dirty and their feet are tired and they need a refreshing break and they see a stream and they take their sandals off and they put their feet in the cold water and they get a drink. What refreshing is that? I wish that you were that way. Or I wish that you were reviving. Think about that early morning when it's 45 degrees outside and you didn't realize it was going to be 45. So you left your windows open and then you close your windows and you get that steaming hot cup of coffee. And you feel it in your hands and you take that drink and as it goes down, it just warms you from the inside and, and revives you. I wish that you were hot. I wish that you were making a difference in the world around you. Refreshing those around you or reviving those around you, but make a difference. Do something. Again, I ask. If your church were to close today, would your community mourn its passing? Would they even notice? And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the definition of lukewarmness. Because if you buy a soda on a hot day and you drink half of it and then you go off and do something and you come back and you've left it in the cup holder of your car and now it's half water and half soda and not cold and not warm or maybe a little warm and you take a drink of it, you go, that is not refreshing. I don't want that in my mouth. Which is exactly what Jesus says. Make a choice. And there's his warning. Look, because you're lukewarm, you are neither hot nor cold. I will spit you out of my mouth. Be something or be gone. Make a choice. Be something. How many of us are refreshing to those around us as Christians? Or reviving? I love, I can't tell you the number of, of people pastors and, and, and church people and lost people that, that I talk to, that I'm always challenging. They'll say, well, this is the way the church is. And I go, really? You know, or it, it, there's a million examples. I got, I got one pastor, Fred, um, and, and he's a little bit out there, but he was talking to me today, talking to me a, a few weeks ago about, about uh, cuss words. And he said, why are they wrong? And I took him to Ephesians chapter Two and I explained to him, you know, about course jesting and all that stuff. And he goes, no, no, that's not what I'm saying. Why are those specific words wrong? If you say with the same intent in your heart, darn it, or the equivalent of what I'm supposed to say, are you not saying the same thing? He said, what is the magical nature of that particular word? that causes it to be wrong? Is it because society has says that's wrong? Well, let me tell you, any of you been in the military? Those words aren't wrong in the military. That's part of everyday speech. Locker rooms are the same way. Prisons have a unique language to themselves, don't they? And those societies don't decide that those, those words are wrong. They're part of their conversation language. I'm not saying we should use those words from the pulpit, but the, the discussion we were having was intent of the word, not the actual word itself. And so refreshing, reviving. Don't worry, it's Sue's phone. She was checking her wristwatch, but her phone's over there. See, she's more technologically advanced than you are. <laughs> so be something or be gone. And then he says to them, Listen, verse 17, because you say, I am rich, and you have become wealthy and have need of nothing, you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, 
and naked. Be aware of your poverty. What would happen in our churches today? In the middle of August, if we turned off the air conditioners and just opened the windows and turned on some fans, we got rid of the comfortable seats and the nice sound system that make us sound better when we sing and speak. How long would it be before people stopped coming? Do you remember the old Brush Arbor revivals? Three days, sometimes five. Outside. In a tent. Under or under uh, like uh, Blue Creek. No, Blue, Blue Ridge. They have that little thing out by the cemetery. It has a metal roof on it. What kind of dumb is that? I preached in a church with a metal roof in Africa and it was, the roof was about this high and it, I, I broiled the top of my head. I didn't have a hat because you're not supposed to preach with a hat on. Our comfort has made us poor. Our church can't stand for much. Oh no, brother Pat, we're, we're strong. Stay home. You might get sick and die. Oh, Let's stay home because we might get sick and die and go see Jesus. Wait, no, we didn't say the go see Jesus part. All it took was somebody in the government to say, stay home. And we did. Be aware of your poverty. Now, there's a sermon it's called An Earnest Warning Against Lukewarmness, and Charles Spurgeon delivered it. Let me, let me read part of it to you. Just listen. Talking about lukewarmness. They have prayer meetings, but there are a few present, for they like quiet evenings at home. When more attend the meetings, they are still very dull, for they do their praying very deliberately or aren't afraid of being too excited. They are content to have all things done decently and in order, but vigor and zeal are considered to be vulgar. They may have schools, Bible classes, preaching rooms, and all sorts of agencies, but they might as well be without them, for no energy is displayed and no good comes of them. They have deacons and elders who are excellent pillars of the church if the chief quality of a pillar is to stand still and exhibit no motion or emotion. The pastor does not fly very far in the preaching of the everlasting gospel, and he certainly has no flame of fire in his preaching. The pastor may be a shining light of eloquence, but he certainly is not a burning light of grace setting men's hearts on fire. Everything is done in a half-hearted, listless, dead and alive way, as if it did not matter much whether it was done or not. Things are respectively done, done. The rich families are not offended. The skeptical party is not conciliated. The good people are not quite alienated and things are made pleasant all the way around. Right things are done. But as to doing them with all your might and soul and strength, the Laodicean church has no notion of what that means. They are not so cold as to abandon their work or give up their meetings for prayer or reject the gospel. And they are neither hot for the truth, nor hot for conversions, nor hot for holiness. They are not fiery enough to burn the stubble of sin, nor zealous enough to make Satan angry, nor fervent enough to make a living sacrifice of themselves upon the altar of their God. They are neither cold nor hot. This was over a hundred years ago. This was the church. And is the church. What happens if you get too out of line in the pulpit? You don't get asked back. I'll give you a witness. Yes. It was just recently, a few weeks ago, I was I was preaching, appealing in for a, a friend of mine. And I was talking about the lost boys, the, the story of the prodigal son. And I call it the Lost Boys because the story is really about the older brother, right? 
and how angry he gets because the father forgives the younger brother. And I got to that point and I was saying, how does that apply to us today? I say, if, it, and I, I, this is how I said it, if Nancy Pelosi walked into the back of the church, she heard the gospel and repented on her face, would you forgive her? And a guy sitting right in the middle in front of me said, no, I wouldn't. And I said, so you would refuse to do what God already did. From the pulpit. And all the air left the room. <gasps> Our preachers have no fire. And you've experienced that, haven't you? They're good preachers. They're intelligent. They're likable and affable. But I think we've developed a fear of offending. It's like he said here. Um, in this part, things are respectably done. The rich families are not offended. The skeptical party is not conciliated. The good people are not quite alienated. And things are made pleasant all the way around. This is what we deal with. Be aware of your poverty. So, what is God's command starting in verse 18? Become wealthy. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments that you may clothe yourselves in and, and, uh, and, and that your, the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed and I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. What do we see here? Gold for their wealth, white garments because they had a textile industry and I salve because that's what they were known for. These are the things when he talked to them, they went, this isn't just some random thoughts that, that Jesus wrote down. He was hitting them right between the eyes where they lived. So when he talks about this idea of gold being refined by fire, what is that? What do we see here? Well, I think the idea, well, first of all, what, is it, what does it take to refine something with fire? Fire. 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 How many of you like to be in the fire? None of us do. What do we like? Comfort. I've said that over and over and over again. As a, as a species, as a North American animal, we love comfort. God says, I want to refine you. I'm going to put you in the fire. I'm going to put you under pressure to turn you from a, a lump of coal into a diamond. I'm going to make your life difficult in order to conform you into the image of my son. Romans 8, 29, those he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed into the image of his son. The word conformed there means squished, squished into the mold of. And every time we get in the fire, what's the first thing we do? Why is it so hard, God? Why is it always me? Why can't I have it easy like somebody else? Because God says, I'm forming you. And it's hard. Stop whining. So where does, what is this gold? What is this wealth? What is this one thing that we need more than anything else? What do we have to buy from God? What does he have to offer us? That's the one thing that can bring us to life. An intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. Not an intellectual relationship with Jesus Christ. Not a get out of hell free relationship with Jesus Christ. I want just enough of them so I don't go to hell. Remember what Mark Twain said. I want to go to heaven for the climate, but hell for the company. And how many people in church do you hear say the same thing? When I was a kid, the phrase was, oh, well, I don't want to be so heavenly minded that I'm no earthly good. Well, Jesus was more heavenly minded than anybody that ever walked the earth. And he was more earthly good than anybody who ever walked the earth. So I don't understand what they mean by that. This relational understanding of Jesus. Go to me. Go with me to. Let me see if I wrote it down. No, Colossians chapter two. I was looking to see if I had a slide for it, but I want you to see these in your Bible. Colossians chapter two, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. Let 
Well, I'm in Philippians. That won't do any good. I'm going, <laughs> this is, no, it's Colossians chapter two. I was looking at it and I was going, those words don't look right. Well, that's because I was in the wrong book. All right, Colossians chapter two. I'm going to read the first three verses. For I want you to know how great a struggle I've had on your behalf, Paul writes, and for those who are at Laodicea. All those who have not personally seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love, attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, and that is Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Let me read that second verse again. And that their hearts may encourage, having been knit together in love, attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of the mystery, of God's mystery, that is Christ himself. What is true wealth, Paul says? Understanding the mystery of God's plan. Which is what? Jesus. Jesus. Now, let me explain something to you. Everybody look at me. The modern American church is going to tell you that everything you need to know about God is in this book. That's not true. How will we know the fullness of Jesus? Well, let me just give you one example. The scripture itself tells us. Go to Ephesians chapter 3. So Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. So just go back to Ephesians chapter 3. And I've got this up on the screen, but I want you to see it in your Bible. And I want you to look at the words and understand the, the trouble here. Paul says, I pray that you know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. How can you know something that surpasses knowledge? What? But how does it get within you? Okay, my wife and I have been married for a while. Now, I need you to understand, she was two when we got married, and, and we've been married for 42 years. So, when we first got married, and she will give me a witness on this, I knew nothing about girls. Still struggling with that. But I didn't know anything about them, and I knew, I knew almost nothing about this girl in particular. But now after 42 years of marriage, we can have an entire conversation with an eyebrow. I can be preaching away and all of a sudden I, she knows I'm going to use an illustration that I shouldn't use. And she'll cock that eyebrow and I'll go, oh, maybe I should go in a different direction. How did we get there? Intimacy. Not just relationship, but intimacy. Her being able to look at me and saying, you're an idiot. You can't say that in church. And I'll go, why? Because it doesn't dawn on me that I can't say things like that in church. You know, how do we get that with God? It's the only way we can get it with God is to spend time with him. And he's going to teach us truths in scripture that are beyond the words in the text. Classic example. What does John 3.16 say? For God so loved. That's an intellectual truth. You know that God loved the world. But at one point in time, did you realize he loved you? That you were worthy, that you were called, that you were transformed. When did you know that? And that goes beyond the text. And that can't be taken from you. And that's riches. I was talking to a guy today, and I may have shared this earlier, but he's going to do some, some work on the house that I don't do. You know, he's going to put in seamless gutters. And he goes, he says, and I guaranteed the workmanship for three and a half years, which I thought was weird. And he said, I guarantee the materials for 25 years. And I looked at him and says, I'm not going to be here in 25 years. <laughs> I said, all things being equal, you know, that'll be 87. Nobody, none, none of the men in my family make it that long. I'll be gone. So I don't care. When do you get to that point where you realize that this is just not it? How many people do you know who go to church who believe that this is still all there is? They don't want to die and go see Jesus because they still have idols in front of God. Well, my grandchildren, well, my children, well, my this, well, my that. 
if you got anything that's keeping you here, that's tying you here to this earth and keeping you from flying when he calls you and wanting that every day, you've got an idol. And we need to be careful about that. True riches comes from the freedom of knowing that you belong to Christ and that you are the inheritance of God. But as long as you believe that riches are what you drive or what you live in or what's in your 401k or what's what, then you're blind. And that's what Jesus told the church at Laodicea. You are poor and blind and naked and wretched and miserable. You want to be wealthy? Then you buy my gold. But how do you get that gold? That gold is refined in the fire. You want it? It's going to cost you. The modern American church will continually tell you, you don't have to do anything. Just accept it and it's yours and your get out of hell free card is signed and you're on your way. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Praise God. What does verse 10 say? For we are his workmanship in Christ Jesus, created to do good works which he prepared in advance for us to walk in. Oh, I'll save you, but I'm going to put you on mission. Oh, no. NCIS is on. I'm not going out there. Those are bad people. Do you know what's going on in the world today? Have you not watched the news, God? God says, I'm moving the chess pieces around, and nothing is happening out there that I didn't plan for. Nothing has happened in this world that I went, oh, didn't see that coming. You want to talk about bad, hang on. But I still have things out there that I expect you to be doing. Oh, no, 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 no. I have my get out of hell free card. Leave me alone. You're neither hot nor cold. Buy gold. The second thing he says is be well dressed. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments that you may clothe yourselves. We've talked about this before. Go to Revelation 19. What are your white garments? I don't have to guess about this. Revelation 19. I'm going to start reading in verse 7. Revelation 19 and verse 7. Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Revelation 19, 8, it was given to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. It is not your white garments washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Your white linen is based upon your godly activity in the world. Your marriage clothes are your righteous acts. What are your righteous acts? Let me tell you right now, we're doing this. We started this project and my grandkids are coming on board. We mow our yard. Cool. Well, you know, the lady to the left of us, left of us, she just lost her, her husband slash boyfriend, whatever it was. And she's doesn't mow. She's, she's young and healthy, but she doesn't get on the lawnmower. So guess what we're going to do? We're going to mow our yard all summer. We got that big old tractor with the five foot deck. Great, we're going to mow the yard. That's righteousness because we're showing our neighbor that we love her. And last week, I was being very selfish. I mowed a part of our yard in the, up by the road that I'd never mowed, hadn't mowed before because we got it this winter. I got it smoothed out so I could mow it. And I thought, you know, it looks kind of stupid just stopping right here with the neighbor's grass being tall. So I just drove to the end of their driveway and came back and mowed that. They came over and thanked us. They haven't said two words to us since they moved in. And they came over and thanked us. We're making relationships. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Righteous acts. They don't have to be big, fancy, super-duper things. They have to be little steps that bring people closer to a relationship with Jesus Christ. But you got to do something. Oh, I know what I can do for God. I can watch more sermons and listen to more podcasts on TV and the Internet. Then I'll be more godly. 
Is that a no? <laughs> if you think going to school forever is going to make you more like God, then you've lost your ever loving mind. You got to get out and do. Because by doing, you learn to be. All right. So he says you need to buy gold. Your riches are come from your relationship to Jesus Christ. You need to be clothed in white garments. And you need to put on this eye salve. We need to be able to see the world the way Jesus sees it. I was a young preacher and I was preaching one time and there was a lady in our church. Her name was Dooley Matouche. And I always used to say there's only two kinds of people in the world. God's children and God's enemies. That's all there is. And Dooley was unique, wasn't she? And she came up after church one day and she goes, I disagree with you, Brother Pat. I don't believe there's only God's children and God's enemies. I said, but Dooley, that's what the, she just put her hand up her quiet and she goes, I believe there's only two kinds of people in the world. God's children and those have the, that have the potential to become God's children. It changed the way I looked at the world. Because where I was seeing enemies before, because I read it in scripture that there was, she helped me see that everybody, no matter how broken, no matter how much I disagreed with them or disliked them, had the potential to be God's child. And it changed the way I looked at the world. She put ISAB on my eyes and changed the way I look at things. Who's putting ISAB on your eyes? 24 hour news? All those people coming across the border, tens of millions of people are the enemy. Oh, no, no. It's the people in Washington that are allowing them to, that are the enemy. Jesus died for all of them. I do not have the power to close the border. But when I run into one of them, do I have the compassion to love them as Jesus would have? If God ever said, Pat, you've learned everything you need to learn in Texas. Let's go to Washington, D.C. I'm going to make you the chaplain for the U.S. Senate. Really? Yeah, that'll be fun. I'll get killed my first week. Yeah, but you don't come see me then. It'll be fun. Come on. We'll go do this. But I don't want to. Oh, come on. It'll be fun. Let's go do this. I have to live in a big city. I have to be around people that I don't really like. I don't like them on either side of the aisle. I think they're all bought and paid for. I don't think they care about us one whit. I know they don't know us, but that's my opinion. But am I seeing them the way God sees them? Do I have ISAP on and my eyes are healed? And when I look at the world, do I see them as incapable of saving themselves and in need of someone who can save them? Or do I look at them drowning and I go, yeah, good luck trying to get out of there, buddy. You deserve it. And I've heard that in my churches. You deserve it. I remember I went to a new church when President Obama was in office. And there was a bunch of elderly men, I'll put it nicely, who were passing emails around about President Obama and they were calling him the Antichrist and blah, 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 blah. And, and anyway, I got drawn into that and one of them said, what do you think? And I said, he can't be the Antichrist. And they said, why? I said, because he can't run a country. How do you think he's going to run a world? And they went. <laughs> and then I took them to Romans chapter 13. And I said, you have to obey those that are in authority over you. That's a scriptural mandate. Oh, they got so mad. They got so mad. But after a while, they started seeing better. And they started praying for their president. They started praying that God would intervene in his life and that he and his wife would become Christians. And for the rest of their lives, they could see differently. And that's what God is saying here. You need to put this eye salve on your eyes so that you can see clearly the way I want you to see. 
Because if you could see the wretchedness of humanity, rather than who's your friend and who's your enemy, then you would understand as I watch the, 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 the billions of people marching down the highway to hell. And I cry out to them, come out, come out. And they look at me and go, shut up. How much it breaks my heart because I died for them. And every once in a while, someone says, take me. And do we stand in chorus with him on that river of humanity saying, come out, come out. Your destiny is destruction. Come out. Or do we sit blithely by going, oh, look, it's a parade. Oh, no, oh, that one deserves to be in the parade. Oh, yeah, those guys too. Oh, hey, there's my preacher. Hi. That's what lukewarm is. So why? what's God's motivation in all this? I need to finish up. So verse 18, again, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and cover the, and cover the shame of your nakedness. Oh, and the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. And I have to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Those whom I love. Now, my version uses two words and only two words. Reprove. You see that? And discipline. Now, you don't need to write all this stuff down. The word reprove in the Greek, as you can see, has a very broad meaning. To test, to convict, to lay bare, to expose, to discipline, or to chastise. God says, if I love you, I'm going to put you out in front of everybody for them to see exactly what you are. And what are you? You're just a sinner saved by grace? No, I said a, sinner. a sinner saved by grace. What else are you? I'm a child of the king. I'm a co-heir of Jesus Christ. I'm the righteousness of God. And all of this is kept in an earthen vessel. And God will say, I will leave you out here. I will put you out there and e exposed. So that others can say, if it's possible for him, it's possible for me. God never saved anybody that was perfect. Mm. But how many of us has he perfected after he brought us on board? The second word that you see there um, is um, discipline. Now, this one is different. This means to educate, to instruct children, to instruct by admonition. Hey, what are you doing, you idiot? Don't touch that fence. It's electric. Okay. And of criminals to scourge. Why did they scourge criminals? Education. You don't want to do this again. And we're not going to make it pleasant for you. All of this word means is education. And did you know that discipline and disciple have the same root word? We want to be disciples without discipline. That's not possible. We need to understand that. Well, the other thing he says there, he says, verse 20, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. This has nothing to do with salvation. People use this verse all the time to talk about salvation, but who's he talking to? He's talking to a lukewarm church. He says, you want to have a relationship with me? What do you have to do? Look at it. No, he's knocking. What do you have to do? Open the door. Open the door. James 4.8 says that if you draw near to God, he will. But who has to take the first step? You do. Who has to open the door in this relationship? You do. And what is the imperative nature of that? Look at what it says. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone opens the door, 
No. Oh, hear, if you hear my voice. If you hear his voice. In your private, quiet conversations with your church friends. Ask him a simple question. When was the last time you heard the voice of God? John chapter 10. You don't have to go there. I'll just read it for you. John chapter 10. Verse 16. I have other sheep, which are not of this fold. He's talking about the Gentiles. He's talking about us. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. They will hear my voice. Now, does that mean it's audible? No, it doesn't always. Sometimes it does. Sometimes you hear it through reading his word, and the Spirit says, hey, this is for you. Now go ahead, and you go, oh, okay, I got that. Um, sometimes other people speak into your life. God's been dealing with you on something, and you think, man, I wonder if I should. And somebody will come up to you and go, have you ever thought about? And you go, well, that was weird. There's a lot of ways God can talk to you. But when was the last time you heard it? When's the last time you cried out to hear God's voice? It's not like if you cry out to God and you're one of his kids, he's going to go, I'm not talking to you. God, I need you. I need to hear you. I need to breathe you. I need to be in your presence. I need you. No. No. You just stay over there. That's not how it works. But we ask for silly things. Oh, God, so and so sick. Would you raise them up so that they don't go be with you? They can stay here in this miserable rotting cesspool with me and be miserable for the rest of their life. What kind of dumb prayer is that? Oh, God. Calm down, scoop them up in your arms, take them to your paradise. I will miss them terribly. But oh, if they could just sit at your feet tonight, that would be so amazing. You don't understand loss, Brother Pat. Yes, I do. I do. Some of the people that I've loved most have gone to be with Jesus, and they didn't take me with them. I was so mad. Some knucklehead people. Well, let's look at the last thing. What does he say about the general exhortation? He who overcomes, overcomes what? His battle against indifference, compromise, self-reliance, and apathy. Self-reliance. That's a big one. He who overcomes, I will grant him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with the Father. See the picture? He doesn't say, I will grant you to sit down on your throne. It's a child sitting in his father's lap. Look at what it says. I will grant him to sit down with me on my throne. I will say, get up here, young one. You did exactly what I wanted you to do. And I'm going to tell everybody in in this throne room that you are mine and I am proud of you. What an amazing thing that is. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Francis Chan recently spoke to a pastor's conference. At least I thought it was a pastor's conference. It may have just been a large gathering of Christians. And in a sermon, he said, the saddest thing in here is not that most of you are lukewarm. It's that when you leave this building, you won't care enough to change. What an awesomely powerful thing to say to the church in America. You won't care enough to change. My challenge to you tonight is, do you care enough to change? Be hot or cold. Be refreshing or reviving. Be something. So the world will be drawn to Jesus. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, again, for your word. Thank you for this time of learning before you. We humbly want to thank you for transforming us. What an amazing God you are. Thank you for wanting to sit with us and and be with us and encourage us and teach us and train us and rebuke us and make us like you. 
Let us be moldable and humble. We bless you, Father, and we honor you, and we pray this in your name. Amen.